important things to keep in mind as we're looking at what we're doing in 23 different from 22. Don't run from the government opportunities just yet. There's still a little bit more out there. Hello, hello, hello. It's Holly Rustic here with Grant Writing and Funding. And I'm super excited to help you grow capacity, increase funding, and to advance mission. Might be the mission of the nonprofit you're working in. Or if you're a freelance grant writer, nonprofit consultant, the many different missions that you help nonprofits serve. All right, so we're going to get into this today to help me do all of that. We have Steve Boland, who is the managing partner of Next in Nonprofits on the Grant Writing and Funding podcast today. Welcome to the podcast, Steve. I, it's actually welcome back. We did one last yes. year, roughly, was it, Holly? So it's good to see you again. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. We'll definitely link to that other podcast in the show notes. You guys do not want to miss out on that. I love having you on a guest. I'm like, I'm so glad you're back on because you always have so much just value to share, right? With the nonprofit world. You've been in, you're a nonprofit veteran with more than 25 years of experience helping charities. And you do a lot with, you actually have a really good wraparound program. And I didn't realize some of the services that you did until we really started talking in the green room a little bit more, because I saw you did a lot with communication mm -hmm. with, you right. know, social media marketing, right, with creating emails, helping people create emails, like all of that. But you also looked very comprehensively at the wraparound for funding as far as writing grants, um, you know, helping with fundraisers, etc. So I love that you look at like, how can we help your nonprofit very holistically to grow in revenue that aligns with your goals. And I think that's right. so important. So next to nonprofits, that's what you guys do. And I absolutely love that. So thank you for coming on and you're gonna be sharing some of the grant funding in 2023 uh, forecasts that we're gonna be looking at. So thanks again for sharing your wisdom. Welcome Always back. excited to be here. It's just so much fun to have the conversation with people that really care about what we do. You know, it's, yeah. it's, there's, there's a lot of complexity to it, but it is so exciting to have the conversation with people that um, are looking to help out these important missions and things are changing. So we just got to stay on top of our game. Yeah. And, and it really is interesting. I mean, just to see, I mean, there's a lot of indicators going on right now. Yeah. I mean, chat GPT is like, Mm -hmm. Right, like AI, <laughs> the impact of AI on grant writing. We're not going to really dive too much today, but we might really spend a little time because that's definitely in the 2023 grant forecast. But also looking at Mackenzie Scott, right, and looking at right. what she's doing to reshape this initiative. And even there's um, another place, Just Fund, I think it's called, and they kind of do something a little similar but different, where as far as you can just submit a one application and then they send it out to potential foundations for you. And that's amazing. Like, so there's definitely this restructuring, I believe, of the very um, interesting gra traditional grant application process where it's very right. highly technical, right? Still technical, but there's a lot of gatekeepers in that traditional mode. And you and I both yeah. know that as grant writers, right? Yeah. It actually, it you know, it's not easy to write grants in the traditional way. And a lot of nonprofits just don't have those specialized skills and they're kind of held back from that. And it's, you know, there's a lot of kind of barriers. So can you just kind of talk about like, you know, what maybe some of those barriers are and the ones that might be changing soon? Well, I think some of the biggest challenge in the grant funding world, and I do want to talk about government grants in particular changing in 2023 from a perspective of folks that write primarily for United States government grant funding. So yeah. um, the the change in the American Rescue Plan Act money kind of, you know, dissipating through systems, it's still there, but it's, you know, it's not something we're going to expect to see a lot of renewals on. So dollars in those things change us. But I think I, you know, want to talk a little bit about the challenges that we see that have been around for a while that maybe are finally starting to shift towards the benefit of the grant writer and the nonprofits that they serve uh, in terms of the more restricted uh, um, uh, ways of thinking about how they might interact and, and release money to nonprofits. Some grant makers have been getting a little bit more and more focused in their program stuff where it's like smaller dollar amounts, shorter periods of time, um, less ability to try and fund what they might view as an overhead cost, what we would think of as an operating. Uh, expense for an, a nonprofit. And those have been uh, things that have been really challenging about the work that we do for a long time to expand the thinking of that gatekeeper that you were talking about to really include all the necessary costs of a program. But the 
kind of diminished pool of general operating applications, the, the lack of ability to do capacity building grants for smaller organizations. Those have been real challenges. And I think mm -hmm. as we look at what might be switching a little in 2023, um, is a landscape maybe needing to change to start thinking a little bit more about general operating support and larger dollar amounts. And we were, again, just ahead of the show talking a little bit about uh, does, you know, Mackenzie Scott so far $14 billion in giving start to make a dent on the rest of the philanthropic sector and how they think about doing that work. Absolutely. And I love that. And I love that you're talking still about like um, that COVID funding coming out, right? And I was talking yeah. to another um, lady too, she's in my mentorship, um, Kiara, and she was talking about, she really focuses on writing Department of Education grants. So US federal grants and DOE. And she said the same thing. She was like a lot of money because DOE did get a lot of money, right? Through some of those funds. And she said, but we need to expend them in 2024. Like, you know what I right. mean? That's when we're going to kind of see that cycle end. So, you know, we really need to think about sustainability and what that really means. And a lot of those funds were just kind of like, in a way, like emergency funds just to kind of get us through. And, and COVID, you know, I think a lot of the perspectives on grant funding started to change a lot and or at least became more like mainstream like our challenges during covid because it was like we just need money to pay the rent yeah <laughs> we, we got to just not fire people right yeah and it was like we've always did that in nonprofits <laughs> but it was like create a program and it was like oh no i got to create a program and suck my one of my executive director or program director out of it just so i can pay them for this program that they don't really need mm -hmm. to do but it's the only way i can get funding you know what i mean so it was like that yeah. whole thing the covid was just like no we need to pay the bills because that's what needs to get done right now we don't have a program we don't have an ability to have a program no one's going to come to our program even if we have a program <laughs> <laughs> it's like right you know? well the in-person stuff right uh, yeah. but i do think yeah. that there was that moment last year when we were still very actively in the middle of the arpa stuff the american rescue plan act pieces and now there may have been i think a false impression like well we shouldn't be spending as much time on grants.gov trying to do prospecting or using other tools because you know that's gone now and like well mm. the large appropriations happened earlier but to the point you were just raising a lot of these programs took some design time within the agencies and they're only rolling out, you know, exactly. for this year, next year. So we're not going to be able to rely on those on an ongoing basis. But I think in terms of changes in 23, um, we're, we're not hearing as much about brand new legislation, brand new appropriations. But if you go back and start looking at the amount of time it took them to roll those things out where there is an application now, where there is an opportunity to make a program impact with a community, there's still a decent amount of money that has now become available this calendar year into calendar year 24 that we need to be thinking of in terms of the clients we're serving uh, as grant writers, whether we're on staff or we're a contractor that's working with a group of people to not uh, just take that for rote, like, well, that's done. I got to go over here. Uh, there's still a lot of digging to do in that space in 23. And I think it's important for people to keep an eye on uh, what things may still be a, a, an available opportunity that you may not even be able to spend the money until 24. You can apply yeah. this year, but you might still be restricted from when you can actually begin that work. So um, important things to keep in mind as we're looking at what we're doing in 23 different from 22, don't run from the government opportunities just yet. There's still a little bit more out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you can see, I, I did kind of a deep dive on USA spending and, you know, like looked at it and really saw like all of the monies trending from prior, like 2019, and then to current date, like on expenditures and, and, and allocations. And it was really interesting because there is a lot of spiking, right? But it was yeah. interesting to me too, because it was like really, the, yeah, the number of grants grew. Absolutely. But in relationship to the amount of money that was allocated, yeah. it wasn't as, it, you know what I mean? There was a lot more money still giving to the same programs or to expanding programs. And I really liked that as well. But like you said, we may see not as much money there in the future because this was kind of a you know, infusion of money to really get nonprofits and to help with um, you know programs and all of that. But to really think about there's still money there, right? And yeah. do you think like from what you what you know and what you've been kind of experiencing with government grants, do you think that some of the application process or maybe just the priorities or the allocations within the um, budgets of the grants, do you think those might shift? Because like we did see more mm -hmm. gen ops during COVID. We've seen more like, 
you know, able to actually fund your administration. Like a lot of time personnel is like no more than 10%, but a lot of those things kind of changed in the last couple of years, especially from the federal grant too. So do you think those will stick? I, I'm a little more concerned that the long trail thing that we're starting to see come out now, that it took a little while for these agencies to design uh, an application process for something that wasn't previously funded. So they went and they took their internal time and they consulted their experts. They came out with something that we're now just finally getting out to application. But be, those tend to be things where they're designing a very specific community need response, where it's like um, we have seen that as a result of COVID, um, these sorts of activities didn't happen. We need something that is very specifically going to address this particular community need. You know, at the beginning, it was certainly just employment of any kind, getting people right. back to work, you know. Um, but there are other things that were uh, impacts around, you know, increasing the ability, the availability and use of hybrid technologies for organizations and communities to meet in virtual spaces. Uh, and those weren't programs that were actively being funded by the federal government pre-COVID. So they had to come in and design a process for what does it mean for us to ask somebody to build capacity in those areas? And what are, what deliverables mm -hmm. are we looking for as a, as a government funder? That took time and comment yeah. periods and all the rest of it. And now we're seeing those. So I, I think a lot of them tend to be, we need you to respond to a specific need. We're not just saying we want to fund organizations that do good work in communities, show us your ideas. But rather we need people to do this very specific thing that didn't happen during COVID. It took us a while to get ready to ask for you to, your participation, but now we're ready to address that response. And you'll probably have a couple years of program time yeah. to do it. Most of these things are, are larger dollar amounts and they are giving you more time to actually implement. So they might not be starting until 24, but they'll go into 25. So you've mm -hmm. got some time to execute but to your earlier point, don't expect those to be ongoing and continuing programs. It's much more of a one-time boost capacity building thing for a community to say, you know, we, we need to have this new way of addressing this community need that we just didn't know about before. COVID highlighted it. We'll give you a couple of years to get it up and running and then don't expect to come back for that same resource. So it is an opportunity mm -hmm. to build relationships in community, to show community what you can do, to build something that you can then leverage in the future. But, um, you know, ongoing program... I don't think we're going to see as many opportunities out of ARPA money uh, in the 23, 24 that we saw earlier. Right. Okay. So that's kind of like the federal grant making landscape in the United yeah. States. And, and as we shift now to more of the community private foundation kind of landscape as well. I mean, Mackenzie Scott has just spun this on its head. Um, yep. She's definitely like, you know, and it, it's interesting Um I see this movement has been happening for quite some time, but now it's really, now there's some money behind really um, creating more momentum for this movement as far as like grants are very bureaucratic, grants are very technical, it takes a long time, we need to come up with a different system. And so she's kind of doing that. So you want to kind of explain what she's doing specifically with like lever for change and yield giving? Yeah. Yeah, which is, I think, so important to differentiate what she had been doing for the last couple few years now in making uh, very large operating support gifts to organizations without any real programmatic outcomes attached to them. We just like, she was finding opportunities on her own with organizations, Boys and Girls Club, Urban League, the um, the names of large groups that many of us have heard of, and sometimes funding smaller affiliates of those organizations, but, you know, usually some big names. Habitat for Humanity, um, with big, big investments that really make an impact over time. Uh, certainly some smaller organizations have been beneficiaries too, but it was a fairly opaque decision-making process before, uh, where she just decided through whatever means you know she and her advisors came up with to um, contact organizations and make an investment in them and uh, not be seeking very specific program outcome reports and all the rest of it, but rather, here's an unrestricted gift of $5 million or whatever it might have been at that time. So she gave away billions of dollars that way. But there was some you know, pushback from communities saying, um, you're doing what you're doing and it's good work and, and that's great, but you are missing opportunities to hear from us grant writers mm -hmm. uh, about why we think we've really got something to offer you that maybe you just haven't heard about yet. What about a more open call? So that has been out there as a criticism of Scott's work for a while, and she um, decided this year to address an opportunity there to at least 
dip a toe in the water of that by doing her first open call. Uh, there are restrictions on this, and it is important to note that uh, organizations need to have been in existence for a few years. You can't be brand new. You need to have reached a certain operating threshold in that time, uh, roughly a million dollars to the $5 million range. Um, there's a little um, leeway around things like audit requirements and what does that mean and all the rest of it. But generally speaking, you got to think you're big enough that a million dollar gift isn't going to just completely overwhelm you. That if you go to right. your, your your little $200,000 a year nonprofit and you get a million dollar gift, uh, you know, there's some concern about is an organization like that going to be capable of stewarding that kind of money over time or is it just going to um, be challenging? So their team thought, let's make sure there's that minimum threshold. But they also bookended it with a $5 million maximum threshold saying we're, we're doing big gifts differently to big organizations. This mm -hmm. opportunity for the open call is for that more medium sized organization that can sustain a $1 million gift, um, I mean, can use it uh, and have the infrastructure to um, be able to make some plans around that, but not so big that we're hitting them with these other things. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, there's not a lot of restriction in terms of uh, you know, this type of program area, you know, it's not literature over here or youth sports over there or whatever. It, that piece, she's willing to hear from a lot of folks and uh, that opportunity is great. There's been a little, again, pushback from community members going, okay, this is an improvement for a lot of us that at least we can make an argument about why we think we should be considered. Um, the first application isn't too arduous, but that's just going to narrow it down to, you know, roughly a thousand uh, opportunities who will then be asked to provide some more information and think through this a little bit for ultimately 250 organizations being selected for a million dollars a piece. So 250 organizations at a million dollars seems like a lot of money until you contextualize it against the 14 billion she's already given away. And it's like, okay, <laughs> $250 million is kind of a test. You know, yeah. I think that we got to be ready for uh, get in if you can for this kind of opportunity, but also be ready that maybe in the future, there's going to be more open calls from larger philanthropy like Mackenzie Scott using partners, Lever for Change, uh, the, those tools to help do some screening. Um, but we'll take advantage of that now. But I think what it means for 2023 is not just kind of a lottery ticket shot at a, a, a million dollar unrestricted mm -hmm. gift. But does that continue to shift the conversation about how existing larger scale philanthropy who traditionally kind of cap into the one $200,000 gifts, they don't do a million dollars in many cases. Right. You see that occasional investment from a Ford Foundation or, a, you know, that kind of a thing, but it's pretty rare. Mostly we're seeing from even big funders, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars as, as one of the largest gifts. And often those are program restricted. So mm -hmm. if, mm -hmm. if what we're hoping to see in 2023 might be taking that conversation of uh, this philanthropist is, you know, even in the open call process, trying to not focus on program restrictions, not focus on specific deliverables, but rather trusting their partners in philanthropy. But now we grant writers get a shot at talking to people like that about why a general investment in our work at a larger scale is going to make a transformative impact on the work that you see in community. And we just haven't had that kind of opportunity to make an application for something like that in 2022, 2021. So this year, getting our first shot at it and trying to leverage what we're putting together for that open call to that larger community conversation with our existing philanthropic partners saying, hey, how, you know, let's talk about stepping up the dollar amount and let's talk about stepping down the requirements and see if we can't deliver even better results for you if you remove some of those restrictions. that you know and, and it's so important because that's that's been such an issue and it's been so talked about you know for so long as far as like a lot of times it's like should you even go after that grant sometimes I say no it's going to be too burdensome for the amount of yeah. cash that you're getting you know like and that's just the reality like sometimes less money for from certain foundations or certain funding sources they require so many reports and all of these you know, restrictions and da, 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 And I'm like, and then it's like $10,000. And I'm like, oh my gosh, no, you can spend more your time better in a different way. And it's not the intention that's off. It's just right. the process, right? So really looking at 
intentions are well, but how do we make the process then fit with that? And, and I love, you know, what she's doing and she's really being able to showcase that on a larger level that a lot of people that have been talking about this, Vule is one of those, right, from Nonprofit mm -hmm. AF. He's like really been advocating for this for a yes. long time. And I really loved seeing that, you know, now foundations are listening and funding sources are listening. And, and that was probably advanced through COVID as well, right, to have that mm -hmm. conversation. So really hoping to see that that trend continues. And it's not to say that people aren't going to need grant writers anymore and they're not going to, you know, you still have to tell story and you still have right. to showcase why it's important for your to invest in your nonprofit, right? So. And I think we don't have to do as much gymnastics as grant writers to try and um, connect, you know, this specific program opportunity to the broader mission of the organization where we're yeah. like, you know, you want to restrict down to this very narrow set of what we do. And absolutely, we do that thing you want. And that's why we're applying. We're certainly not going to apply for organizational fits that, that are just bad and, and it's not the right thing. Right. But when right. we have to spend so much of our time and energy saying, here's the program outcomes that you're defining, here's how we're going to put that together so that your money can be kind of attributed to that program outcome yeah. rather than just let's talk about the impact we're having in community writ large let's talk about that because i would rather write that story as a grant writer than go oh, i have to ignore the big part of the story in order to get my you know two thousand mm -hmm. characters focused on just the thing they want to hear about mm -hmm. even though the more compelling story for me to tell is this bigger one but your mm -hmm. application wants me to focus down to just this thing and it gives me only so many words to do it and therefore we miss on these. And if we can convince our granting partners to let us talk about the real impact of everything we're doing, there's still going to be a lot of important work for us to do telling that story, but it won't be quite so restrictive in how we go yeah. about telling it. We, I think, are kind of now incumbent to leapfrog on what Scott and others have been doing here to go back to our other funding partners and say, we're really excited to apply for this opportunity with you. We really do hope that in the future, Future, additional opportunities for less restricted grants, larger investments, longer terms are things that you can see coming from your partnership with us. Because, you know, it doesn't feel like we can ask for anything when you're asking for the money, but I feel like we can also highlight the direction of philanthropy in 23 is maybe got an opportunity to shift. And if we all also step forward, uh, when we hit that submit button and, you know, have that any further comments area and just say the importance of unrestricted grants of time, uh, flexible grants that are not just one year that can stretch into a little bit more of, of grants that are larger dollar amounts that we can really get some impact on. Those are stories we want to tell you. So let us have that opportunity. We'd really love to be able to share that that with you and see if we can't broaden the conversation some. I love that so much. Yeah. And it's, it's so important. And, you know, just kind of uh, backpedaling a little bit is a part of what you said, like that, those gymnastics, right. <laughs> writing gymnastics. And, you know, one thing that has always frustrated me to no end is to say, oh, it has to be, it cannot be an existing project that we're going to fund. It has to be a new project. So sometimes there's a little bit of those gymnastics to be like, okay, how do we make this yeah. new, even though it's existing, how do we expand it? And it's just like, oh, if you would just fund what we're doing, it would be great instead of us having to kind of like, right. like you said, those writing gymnastics and mind mm -hmm. kind of gymnastics to figure that out. And it's like, it's still the same impact, right? It's still the same impact. You're still doing the same work, but sometimes you have to duplicate it and call it a new program or something like that, just because the funding source wants their stamp on that certain program or whatnot. And it doesn't make any sense really for nonprofits. So I just wanted to point that out. The other thing I wanted to point out is I really do like, and I like how we're talking about this work that Mackenzie Scott's doing to really kind of start changing the paradigm on a more mainstream basis on applications. But I would also have to say that, yeah, she did get a little pushback as you were talking about right. as far as like from the smaller nonprofits that may not have a million in annual operating. And just like you said, I completely get it. If you have 150 or 200,000 and you're gonna get a million dollars in funding, a lot of nonprofits would be jumping up and up and down with joy until they Amen. get that money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it's like, oh no, I've seen grants at large destroy nonprofits, quite honestly. Like, you know, there is some, I understand where she's coming from, but I also kind of look at it from the view of the smaller nonprofits to say, how do we get there then, right? Mm -hmm. How do we get there? And and just there is that that movement of large nonprofits becoming larger, 
right? So we're kind of seeing that monopoly, not monopolization in a sense in the nonprofit sector. Can you kind of speak to that a little bit? Yeah, well, I, I think it's important to recognize that that million dollars will crush you if you need to spend it in the first year, right? If if you go to a $200,000 a year nonprofit, and you say, here's an unrestricted grant, and you can take as long as you need to to grow into this, where you can, you know, have the time to hire staff and put processes in place and get your first HR manual, because you never had one before, because you didn't have mm -hmm. any staff, really, you had like one person. So uh, there's, there's going to be less concern about that if the restricted fund part of it is smaller. But it does mean you need to be willing to let newer organizations emerge into that space and tell you stories about what they would like to do rather than for the last four years, here's what we have done, and right. therefore we can leverage it to this other thing. But rather, we don't see people in our community meeting a need the way that we think it's important to be met. Let me tell you that story. And here's why we think we're the ones to help meet that need. So if if the restriction on any grant source is, you know, we need two years of operating expense at certain dollar amounts and whatnot, I think that that's rightful criticism to say uh, you are perpetuating systems for folks that are were lucky enough to get brought in before these granting structures came in that way. Uh, and then it just becomes, you know, only those organizations are going to see those opportunities. Um, I think that one one of the things I find a little bit more challenging about um, the um, how do you break into this work for a smaller organization, a new mission, a new idea kind of thing, uh, isn't even necessarily that there aren't twenty and forty and fifty thousand dollar grants. That if you start piecing those together, you know you can start then building to the fifty and seventy five thousand dollar grant, and then you start building, and that takes a little bit of time. It does. But, the, mm -hmm. but there's ways to do that. Mm -hmm. I think it's harder to look at other grant-based funding sources that might feel more like sponsorships, uh, corporations, those kinds of things, where they really are kind of mega focused. It is so hard for a newer uh, effort to break into those types of funding streams. So, uh, mm -hmm. and that just becomes self-reinforcing that if you, you know, hear yeah. about the Coca-Cola sponsorship for big nonprofit A, um, and then you're, you're trying to say, well, we do things differently from big nonprofit A. And we think there's a really good reason to do them differently. And not that they're mm -hmm. bad, but different has a place. And we want to mm -hmm. tell you that story. But if there's no way to actually make the application because we didn't meet criteria Y or criteria right. Z, then that story doesn't get out. Um, I, I think right now, th this may be the not so different in 2023. The, the, the way that we continue to work with smaller nonprofits on that is we have to start with smaller grants and build. Mm -hmm. uh, we just aren't able to break into transformational grants for those smaller new newer players that don't have the same kind of track record. Um, and I'm, you know, look forward to hearing from your audience commenters, because I, I know that there's going to be thoughts on, well, we actually have some thoughts on that. So other people that are not talking on this particular podcast are going to go, we have ideas. So let's share those so know, comments <laughs> yes. and, uh, and learn from each other, because there's going to be ways to do that. I don't see a lot of it happening in the folks that we're serving right now. And that's unfortunate. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm seeing a little bit of it. Like I mentioned that Just Fund, you know, you can submit one mm -hmm. application, then they send it out to funding sources on your behalf and a nonprofit um, that I'm on the board of just received a grant that way. And it was oh, it was fantastic. Yeah, it was $50,000. Like it's a small nonprofit to start up and they got $50,000 and they didn't even directly submit to the funding source. They went through this, this one entity that then sends it out and connects kind of like a dating app. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> and I was like, that's a nonprofit cool. matchmaker. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, I think it's super cool that people are starting to think about this, especially in needs um, that are more, you know, like very specific, like, you know, it's, we do a lot of indigenous work with reproductive rights and that's very specific. Mm -hmm. And those funding sources really want to give to that. Right. So it's like looking at, and people are starting to step up, but yeah, I would love to hear more of these stories so we can get them out there. Um, because I am also seeing kind of what you're seeing too, is I, I still am seeing more of that traditional sense with a lot of foundations, uh, funding sources to have a program, very specific, project oriented, all of that. They want specific outcomes. So I do think, yeah, I like, I like though, as there are there's some broad need to this, right? Yep. So really looking at more gen op support, like I've always been all the time, right? Whenever there's a gen op grant up. Right. <laughs> so we're seeing some of that from government. You know, the other place I've seen it from is local government. 
So from the mm -hmm. Economic Development Authority locally, I've seen them open up more things that are a little more gen op. And it's like, yeah, you can pay for your rent and your, your personnel through this and nothing else. Like that's all you need to, you know, you don't have to back up a program with it too. So I'm really applauding that as I see a little bit more local government open up to that as well. And I think that's kind of following the trend of some of these other places. So that's cool, <laughs> but yeah, still some work to do as well mm -hmm. in that area. So what yeah, about, would... oh, go ahead, go ahead. A quick question for you about 2023 in terms of, you know, because I'm I'm interested to hear from other people that are, um, are they seeing uh, as much, you know, pauses and reevaluations as we saw pre-COVID? Because I don't see that happening as much as we, I, I there would just seem like it's 10 or 15% of every foundation that I've ever contacted every year would just go, oh, we're doing a strategic planning pause. We're going to reevaluate. And, you know, now we're going to fund this other thing completely different from the stuff we were funding three years ago. And then we're going to do that for three years and then we're going to pause. And I'm not seeing that happen as much in, in the folks that we're connected with. And I don't know if you're hearing anything about mm -hmm. our, our organizations feeling the pressure to keep in the game, to stay with it and keep making gifts because yeah. of the need in community. Or um, is it just a smaller subset that I'm seeing? Yeah, I think you're right. I haven't seen it as much either. I mean, I did see like super quick priority shifts in the beginning of COVID. And I think yeah. we saw a lot of that where like one of the nonprofits I work with and they were always getting this consistent funding. And then out of the blue, the funder was like, we're not doing that anymore. We're just funding this. Like, you know, I did see that like quite like, and I think they were just trying to be speed to market in certain priority sections mm -hmm. that they felt like, you know, but so there was a little of that, which was like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> those organizations. Um, but you're right though, in the in the long term, the last few years now, consistently I haven't seen those pauses as much. Funding cycles seem to be open consistently. Um, so that's that's good. Yeah, I hadn't even thought about that. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's let's also talk about because we couldn't like not add in this conversation. We're talking about 2023 funding for our grants. Um, chat GPT, AI. <laughs> What are sure. your thoughts on that? <laughs> I've tried it. I mean, I'm sure any of us that have had to work within, you know, uh, creating content uh, on a regular basis of like, is it really as good? I mean, can it, can I really get a structure out of this? And mm -hmm. um, I've I've tried a few different ways uh, at the GPT-3. Now, I have not had a chance to really play around with 4. And these things are evolving so quickly and oh new gosh. versions coming out, Google's mm -hmm. Bard and all these other pieces. So uh, it could be that those tools are going to get better at what they're talking mm -hmm. about doing. But for me, um, the time that it takes to craft a good enough uh, sample of here's what I want to answer within this framework of, you know, a thousand words or, you know, 2000 characters or whatever I've got to work with. Um, I spend more time refining and rewriting than I would if I just really put things together for me. So I get where people are saying it's evolving, it's newer, it's a way of trying to get you a draft that you can kind of clean up instead of having to start from whole cloth. Um, and maybe part of that is just that I've been doing this for 25 years and I don't feel like starting mm -hmm. from whole cloth is as hard. But for somebody who's newer to the grant writing world and building a, a, a library of some words, maybe this is going to be a tool that will help them spur some ideas to go, oh, I, I see where, you know, this chat GPT thing answered some questions in this way. And it gives me a really good sense of how to clean that up without right. spending as much time on original language creation. I don't find it as useful yet, but boy, it is yeah. certainly evolving quickly. So is it 2023 where we're going to be using that as a tool to make sure we're getting a, a good starting place? It's certainly not going to replace a grant writer anytime in the near future. It could be a mm -hmm. place where people say, I need to look at a framework and then yeah. start editing from there. And maybe this can give you the framework. Uh, but I, I don't see it as much in 2023 for the more experienced people, but maybe it's a, a helper for folks that are building language libraries to start with. Yeah. Yeah. And I second that. I did, And I also just want to make people, because um, so, some of the, the tool that can be really useful is the research part, right? We spend yes. a lot of our time deep diving into research, but I would say a word of caution that I have seen research come back that's not accurate at right. all. So definitely you got to second check all those sources and citations to see if they're even real, because I have seen people not even be able to find those at all. 
So, um, you know, it makes it look all pretty, but is it, is it real? Where are they getting the information? Right. So there's definitely some, some things and who knows where it's going to be in a year from now or in six months from now. Like, it's just, like you said, it's changing so rapidly. Um, but the other thing with that I'm thinking is as we kind of make the grant application process less acrobatic, right. Right, as you we were talking about, we're maybe talking. a little more streamlined, then actually that in my mind that could apply with using chat GPT a little bit more, right? Because part of the traditional grant making is that's hard to apply to chat GPT or any AI because of all of those acrobats <laughs> that we right. need to do. But as it becomes maybe more streamlined, it could be used more. And here's my question. And I'm wondering what you, you feel about this. For me, it's almost like, I, it, yeah, it's going to change grant writing a little bit, but really the process to me, because if more nonprofits with um, can start pumping out grants real quick, right, especially if they're more streamlined, then it's really the process to me that's a little bit that I'm thinking about, like, because it takes a lot of capacity to review proposals. So if you're mm -hmm. all of a sudden getting a huge influx of proposals and your capacity is, you know, limited, how are they really going to be able to vet those appropriately or really not to say that chat GPT is making up anything, but how are they have so many more proposals to look at now? Like how are, you know what I mean? So are they going yeah. to have to embed more stipulations then or less, or, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, one of the, just going back to the uh, Scott application thing, one of the things that they're doing because they expect to be flooded, they expect that they're going to have yeah. so many applications coming in is they're requiring a 90 second video. Um, yeah. We want you to give us a synopsis of what's going on human to human. Tell us just what's happening here. And then we're going to be able to rely on some of the written information and all the rest of it. But it's a way mm -hmm. of speeding up the screening process for them. And it, that's a really interesting thing of if it's relatively effective and not very difficult for a lot of organizations to pump out a lot more applications, there may be things that are not quite as good fits where people are like, well, might as well take a stab at it. I mean, you know, the right? chat GPT is doing most of the work. Yep. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think that we may end up seeing uh, the, the counter of that because there are um, embed tools that are being used to detect machine written language. Uh, and mm -hmm. you can run those things through. When I used to teach uh, fundraising for Hamlin University, um, I was surprised at some of the Blackboard related tools that I was able to use to just check language in things that were screened ahead of me to find out are there direct lifts out of you know existing literature in this kids uh, or young person's um, paper that they just submitted, mm -hmm. and you know sometimes this thing would go, oh look at this, you know you didn't know to read that article that was over here this other place, but the machine found it, and I think mm -hmm. very similarly mm -hmm. it's going to be possible for the grantors to go, wow we're getting flooded, I need to find a screen against all the stuff that is just obviously machine generated, and that's not hard to do. Uh, that yeah. part of it may be something that they have to kind of come back at. So if we get too complacent saying, well, the chat GPT thing is pretty good. And maybe by four, it's really good. Uh, mm -hmm. And I can therefore, you know, get more content out there in front of more eyes. Uh, is that going to have the undesired effect of, of, you know, turning on all these filters and just trashing all of those applications that were uh, started from a machine generated place? I don't know how the grant reviewers are going to have to respond to that. If they end up with, right. you know, a hundred times more applications, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's going to have a reverberation. I, I'm not seeing that yet in 2023, yeah. but gosh, maybe we will. Well, I just, you know, what I saw it was I, with, uh, is a publication company. And so yeah. this made me start thinking about it. So a publication, sci-fi, they publish sci-fi sci books, novels, and they get, they said 10 on average per day applications, like submittals, right? And then they said, as soon as ChatGPT like got really popular the last few months, a hundred a day. And they just had, a, they just had to shut down they, for yeah. a moment and say like, we got to take a pause because we don't know how to address this. Right. Yep. So, cause we don't want to make to submit, like we believe in, you know, still having the submission process free, but we don't have the capacity to review all of this. And it just made me start thinking about that could easily happen with grants at some point. And yep. not to say even that using chat GPT to 
create some applications is isn't good because I think that is actually can take a lot of um things off of the nonprofit people right like executive directors or they're writing these grants like they need to focus on being an executive director if that's helping them get their information and funding in front of funding sources eyes I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing either but it's like it's just like wow that's going to be an, an issue I think that may the whole system we may have to relook at the system and I like that that video that you talked about the 90 second video right. showing something a little bit more personal, like, you know, and trying to do it that way um, as well, like kind of relooking at the application process, I think is actually a really good thing. And if this kind of spins it on its head and makes us kind of shift the paradigm because of some like bottlenecking some of these processes, it might actually be a good thing, right? In my eyes. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think that in terms of accessibility, uh, as we mm -hmm. look at 2023, the that's a good guardrail for the funder, you know, yeah. like because they're saying, you know, any smartphone video does not have to be this edited, whatever. Right. We just need a human talking to us for 90 seconds uh, about this. And that is going to favor people that speak well on camera. And that's yeah. not everyone. And that is going to, you know, mm -hmm. some people, of course, will hyperproduce that thing. And it's hard not to be impacted by that if you're looking at video after video and some of them are washed out. Out and some you can barely hear the person talking and then yep. you get the one where there's a communications department that sat down and there's nice titles and how do you not have that be more influential against that mm -hmm. startup organization that's got really important things to say but they don't have a communications team to shoot a video yeah. they have a smartphone probably got access to that but mm -hmm. if if we're looking at how is our grant writing process going to be impacted by more and more and more content being generated out there and the guardrails that get put up as well, let's talk about video. That's advantageous to some of us and it's problematic for others. So yeah. uh, I, we we have to see how that one plays out. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, for the folks that I'm working with on on some of those applications, we're kind of excited about the idea that we get to talk more directly to somebody who might be reviewing this in a way that feels more personal. But I don't know that every charity is going to be excited about that. And, you know, right. we'll, we'll have to see. That's such a good point. Thanks for bringing that up because, yeah, there is trying to address inequity there's still inequity within some of that right so we need to yeah. like point that out and to also say that because yeah that could be a huge disadvantage for a lot of people and or even saying i only have 90 seconds to like talk about my mission and you know what i mean like how mm -hmm. do you say all that it's kind of like having 250 characters right. <laughs> I mean? like, so the constant struggle kind of, of a grant advice. writer yep yeah. So there's a lot of that. Well, thank you so much. I mean, you have like provided, so we could go on talking and talking and talking about all of this yeah. <laughs> grants and funding in 2023 in the future. Um, but, you know, all of this about like looking at what funding's out there, still keep going out there to grants.gov for all you people yeah. like that are looking at federal U.S. federal grants. There's still money there. Um, it's going to be there for a little while. So do look at that if that makes sense for your nonprofit. And, you know, looking at the different types of funding sources that you might be able to see like um, Mackenzie Scott, right? But just don't put all, like you said, the lottery, don't play that only on its own. Try to influence other people in your area as well, like your partners and stuff to talk about these issues, right? And why it's important to have types of like unrestricted funding and those types of things, because it really does help your mission. So thanks for sharing all of this, Steve. Did you, anything else you want to uh, share before we close out today? Yeah, Holly, just thanks for having this conversation. It's always fun to talk to you. Um, if folks want to learn a little bit more about us, it's nextinnonprofits.com. You'll find us on the web, all kinds of information there. So yeah, look forward to hearing from people who are like, oh, I got things you should hear about, Steve. Go find me. Tell me what they are. Yes, and you can also listen to Steve Bullen's podcast, Next in Nonprofit. Yes. So do check it out. All you podcast listeners, go there and subscribe right now because <laughs> you have an amazing podcast and yeah, it's such a great, great knowledge to share with all of the things going on with nonprofits and with helping with funding. So thank you so much for being on again, Steve. And once again, you guys, nextinnonprofits.com, do check it out. You also have a free consultation available for yep. nonprofits if they want to check out some of your services that you provide to help them with funding and to streamline all of that. So thank you so much again for coming on the show and I will see you back on the grant writing and funding podcast soon. Thanks, Holly.